The following is a hoop ball presentation. Well, there's no perfect way to open up a show like this. I can't say welcome to the Hoop Ball Clippers pod, and Ethan can't say welcome to the Hoop Ball Lakers pod because we have merged into one, Ethan. We are the Hoop Ball Clippers and Lakers pod for one day, at least one day only. And this is our first time getting a chance to actually do a podcast together, and we're going to talk Clippers and Lakers. But first, what's up? How are you? I'm so, I'm great, man. I'm stoked. I'm stoked to be doing this with you. And you know, I think like LeBron said the other day, the real uh, winner of the summer is Staples Center, right? Yeah, I mean, LeBron and Kawhi are coming together for one day at least to see who truly is going to be king. We'll discuss the starting lineups for both teams. We'll talk about the benches. We'll talk about some of the projections for both teams, and frankly, the perception of both teams as well here in Los Angeles, and how already. We're seeing Kawhi get booed at a football game. He was at the Rams game, I believe it was, last week, and he got booed. So clearly, Ethan, you guys are still the top of the town. And you will always be top of the town is the way I see it, at least for the foreseeable future. For you, coming into this season, is it weird having the Clippers be right up there with you guys? It's not weird, but it's it's definitely different. I mean, it's something that, you know, we as Lakers fans probably aren't used to seeing. But I think the reality is the Lakers haven't exactly been uh, what you might be used to over the last several years. So I think it's going to be a different season for both teams in that regard. Yeah, it, it's definitely an interesting season because I don't remember a season like this for the Clippers ever. I've been a fan of the well, team. No. I've talked about it since 2000. And there obviously have never been expectations like this for the Clippers. You're used no to it, though. I mean, you're used to being called a contender and you're used to going to NBA Finals. So it's just so strange that a year like this, where you have the Lakers that got Anthony Davis, yet despite that, they're still not being called the favorite, which is so wild. Well, that that's exactly what I was thinking. And, you know, before we were talking about the Clippers in 2000, I was having flashbacks to the Elton Brand jersey that's still hanging in my parents' closet. But beyond that, I think with the Lakers, if you would have told me this time last year, if you would have guaranteed me, hey, the Lakers are going to be able to keep Kyle Kuzma and get Anthony Davis to pair with LeBron James, I would have been feeling pretty good about their title chances. And not that I'm not now, but there's so much parity just in the Western Conference alone that the Lakers' road to the title is that much more challenging as a result. Yeah. It, for By the way, we didn't correctly uh, introduce ourselves. I'm Brandon Marcus. Ethan Noroff. I cry, I said that last name correctly, right? It was it was beautiful, man. Like, okay. you know, it's almost like we had a similar upbringing in the San Fernando Valley for it's you to true. do that. It's true. I got to tell you guys, before we started recording, Ethan and I were talking about our elementary school days, our high school days, and what we do now. And we're similar ages. And so we know the exact same areas in the Valley. I got to tell you, it, it's Dan and I have talked about the 405 and the 101 before on a podcast, but Ethan and I, we're going even deeper. We're going into certain cities. That's how well Ethan and I know each other without knowing each other. So I expect big things from this podcast. And Ethan, where can people find you on Twitter? As do I. People can find me on Twitter at Ethan underscore Noroff. And if you ever see me out in public, I promise to you that my body language is not representative of how I feel on the inside. Come on up and say what's up to me. There you go. And I'm at BD Marcus. So we're excited. It's a hoop ball Clippers and hoop ball Lakers presentation. Ethan, let's start with the starting lineups because Absolutely. this is what I think differentiates the two teams is that the Lakers are very top-heavy. You can say the Clippers have their two guys as well, but we'll talk later about the depth. You have the King, and you have Anthony Davis. With those two guys, I know the talk of the summer was, doesn't matter who else is around them. As long as you have LeBron and AD, you're fine. Do you actually right. feel that way, or maybe watching that first preseason game, or just looking into the analytics, or looking into the team, do you think maybe they need a couple more pieces besides for obviously Kyle Kuzma? Are you happy with those two in the starting lineup? Well, I mean, Anthony Davis and LeBron James, obviously the the best place to start, in my opinion. But but around them, especially if Kyle Kuzma is going to miss some time at the start of the season, which seems to be a pretty good possibility at this point. I don't think the Lakers have come outright and said it, but they've said, eh, you know, we'll kind of check him out when we get back from China, this, that, and the other. And we're going up against a timetable that's impossible to ignore. So if I'm the Lakers and I look at the rest of this, you know, perceived starting lineup as well as the bench, there's def definitely more depth than there's been over the past several seasons. But 
beyond Anthony Davis and LeBron James, God forbid one of those guys were to sustain an injury of some sort, I would question the scoring power of this team without one of those two. Let's talk about the starting lineup. You asked me before we started what I thought the Clippers' starting lineup was going to be. Uh, I'm curious from you, who do you think is going to be the starting five on opening night? Because we've heard a lot about LeBron possibly playing point guard, or do you think Rondo is going to be starting at point guard? So I've been pretty vocal about this recently, and, and I feel like Avery Bradley, right? Avery Bradley did start the first preseason game. And I always feel like that's somewhat of a tell by a head coach. I mean, it kind of has to be, right? So the starting lineup in the first game was Avery Bradley with Danny Green, LeBron, AD, and JaVale McGee. Avery Bradley has made so much noise at camp, and in my opinion, there's a, there's a good argument for Rajon Rondo to be the odd man out. Unfortunately, I don't think he will be, but I think DeMarcus Cousins being hurt and unavailable – actually pushes Rondo out of the starting conversation more than it brings him in. Because if DeMarcus Cousins and Anthony Davis are down low, Rajon Rondo is almost the guaranteed starter because of the history they had with the New Orleans Pelicans. But because of the DeMarcus Cousins injury and the possibility for either JaVale McGee or Dwight Howard to claim that spot, I feel like Avery Bradley might be the guy at point guard. Because like you said, if LeBron is handling the ball, Avery Bradley doesn't have to worry about that responsibility. So if people want to say he's not a traditional point guard, that's fine. He doesn't have to carry that torch. There are so many different things to unpack from what you just said. Uh, first of all, the fact that we are talking about Avery Bradley as much as we are shows you that the season needs to start. Uh, this right. is a guy that the Clippers just were thrilled to get rid of. Absolutely thrilled to get rid of. He was awful for them. Just not And he good was. At all. And to be fair, he was. He was not playing well. Yeah, he was awful. I mean, he couldn't do anything offensively. His defense, obviously, everyone was talking about, but he was stealing minutes from SGA, and clearly that was not what you wanted to see. And you've now seen that Shamit SGA are two guys that you needed to have on the floor, whereas Avery Bradley's a guy that now is getting all this hype. And I read on Twitter yesterday that apparently all it took was one half for Avery Bradley to get benched. So I'm very curious to see how long of a leash Vogel gives him because that might be a key. As strange as that is, the fifth guy in that starting lineup, because obviously you're going to have, like you said, McGee or Howard is going to be the center. You're going to have AD and you're going to have LeBron, most likely going to have Kuzma when he's healthy, whether he comes off the bench or starts, who knows. But if you look Danny Green as well, I mean, you have a lot of different pieces you can put in. That fifth guy, though, is going to be huge. And so if you are the Lakers, how long do you stick with Avery Bradley if he doesn't show that he is that lockdown defender and that three-point shooter that he's been in the past? I don't think it's very long because they do have options. It's not just Rajon Rondo. They brought in Quinn Cook. They brought back Alex Caruso. And as much as Alex Caruso is the human meme on Twitter, he actually is a player who could, in theory, very much help this Lakers team. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I thought he was really good towards the end of last year. Now, tell me a little bit about that shooting guard spot. Because if you look at ESPN and their depth chart, they currently yeah. have Danny Green as a starting yeah. two. What's yeah. going on there? I, I mean, I have to feel like Danny Green is going to be the starting shooting guard on this team. It's hard to believe they would bring him in at that number for him to play a role off the bench, especially if Kyle Kuzma is going to assume that six-man role, and it sure seems like he is. Because for me, look, if Kyle Kuzma's in the starting lineup, he is at best the third option offensively behind AD and LeBron. But if he comes off the bench, especially if he's staggered with one of those two out of the game, he is able to leverage his strength, which is scoring, a little bit more effectively. And that might help him in terms of the transition for his role this year because the Lakers are going to ask Kyle Kuzma to do something that he hasn't proven yet. They're going to ask him to defend consistently. They're going to ask him to hit the three-point shot consistently. They're going to ask him to rebound consistently. They're going to ask him to play make consistently. We know Kuzma Kuzma can score, but that's not what this Lakers team needs from him. Okay, let's go position by position here. Let, let's go each team point guard. So you think that the starting point guard, oh, can we say LeBron James? Because Avery Bradley's not a point. I mean, can, well, can, can we yeah, say that? So, so if, if you want to say that in the starting lineup, if you're saying that both Avery Bradley and LeBron James are in it, which is what I'm saying, uh -huh. call them whatever you want. They're both in there for me. Okay. So we'll say LeBron is a starting point guard for the Lakers, and that actually becomes a thing. Pat okay. Beverly is who I believe will be the starting point guard for the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, okay. I think, obviously, comparing those two, you can't even do it because LeBron James is one of the top two sure. players of all time. Um, Patrick Beverly, what he brings this team is toughness and grit. Um, defense, he brings you the ability to rebound for a guard, um, the ability to get steals and blocks, and he's a good three-point shooter when he's needed to be. 
so I think the actual point guard position, I think, is so different for these two teams. And what, frankly, is the most fascinating thing is that these two teams, as high of expectations as both have, could not be built any differently. Because you have LeBron, obviously, at point versus Beverly at point. And that right there shows you how different the two teams are. Without question. But I will say, if you're comparing Patrick Beverly to Avery Bradley, this becomes a whole different conversation. In what way? I, well, I would give the edge to, to Patrick Beverly and the Clippers yeah. at the position if it's just a head-to-head comparison just because we haven't seen Avery Bradley really do it since he's been in Boston, and that wasn't exactly yesterday. Patrick Beverly has shown that he has consistently brought this level of effort and this level of skill to this Clippers team, and last year a huge part of them achieving what they were able to do was built around what Patrick Beverly infused this culture with. So let's say, just for comparative sake, it will be easier, obviously, to do Kawhi versus LeBron. Let's, let's do Beverly versus Bradley I think we sure. both agree that the Clippers have the advantage there I of course 100 percent okay let's go to shooting guard um right now the Doc Rivers said yesterday these are words that he literally just said the Clippers were gonna have a sliding starting lineup which means that they're going to continuously switch it up and why they're going to do that is because they're going to put Kawhi and PG at the 2-3 and the 3-4 so they're going to switch it up. And because of that, we don't know who's going to actually start at shooting guard. But just for this sake, let's say that Landry Shamit is the starting shooting guard for the Clippers. Let's compare him to Danny Green. Two guys that are obviously good three-point shooters. Danny Green known for being a three-point shooter in that 3 and D. We saw in the playoffs last year that Landry Shamit pretty much locked up Steph Curry, which is crazy to hear and crazy to say. But right. Shamit was great defensively in the playoffs last year. How do you think those two stack up? Because I think it's closer than people think. I think it's closer than people think, too. And I don't think people realize just how good Landry Shamit looked, especially once he joined the Clippers team. If I'm the Clippers, I am super excited about the potential for him, in addition to everything else that's going on with this roster. But I feel like Danny Green... Man, I, if I'm the Lakers, let me put it like this. If I'm the Lakers, Danny Green has to be more valuable than Landry Shamit for this team to reach its potential. I would agree. I, I think that's well said. Because if you don't have Danny Green um, being the guy that you were waiting for all of right. free agency after Kawhi decided, then you're in trouble. Because if you're not having production from Avery Bradley and you're not getting production from Danny Green, those are your two guards and that's not good because then you're going to put all of the pressure on AD and LeBron. And if you do that, these guys are going to break down. And like you said earlier in the show, if one of them gets hurt, this team is in big trouble. And this really just highlights the importance, shall we say, of a potential Andre Iguodala addition. The Lakers are absolutely waiting that situation out. But the problem is so are a lot of other teams. The Clippers are probably keeping an eye on that one. The Rockets are probably keeping an eye on that one. And the Warriors are probably keeping an eye on that one. So the Lakers wouldn't be alone in their interest. But man, that is a player this roster could use. A lot of talk was about Andre Iguodala joining the Clippers. And I don't think that's going to happen. It doesn't make sense with this roster. Um, you and I talked right before we started recording that we think Noah is a better fit for the Clippers in terms of they need a backup big. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I just don't think Iguodala is an option. You bring up a good point, though, that Iguodala would be a good fit with the Lakers and give them a little stability possibly off the bench if one of these guys was to get hurt. He's not going to obviously produce like he has in the past with Philly and then with Golden State, but he's still a guy that can be very good. Absolutely, and I think he's a guy who can, who has proven it more recently than a guy like Avery Bradley has. And look, the, the potential of this Lakers team is off the charts. However, there's a very real difference between the floor and the ceiling when it comes to what could be on either side. All right, let's go to the center position. I want to skip small forward and power forward. Obviously, okay. the former Laker, Zoo, will be the starting center for the Clippers. Um, how, and how did you feel when they brought him back on that? What was it, four years and $28 million this summer? Yeah, pretty cheap deal, honestly. I, I thought he did a really good job last year for what he needed to do. He's not obviously going to be someone that you pick up in fantasy basketball and expect big things from. Um, he's not going to get you 20 and 10 um, right. on a given night. That's just not who he is. I think he was better analytically defensively than people think. Um it's very surprising that some people think that McGee is leaps and bounds better defensively than Zoo because the numbers don't show that. 
Um, and I think he's going to be a good piece for, for what they need. I'm, did, did you like him when he was with the Lakers? I mean, I liked it. There were things I liked about him and things that I didn't, you know, like any player really. That's not a top 10 player, let's say, in this league. But I think with Zoo, with Zoo for four years and $28 million, first of all, it's a movable contract. You're always going to be able to move at least a backup big with that skill set at $7 million a year. So it gives you flexibility to, no matter what. And if he develops into the player that you think he's capable of developing into, that contract could be a bargain as soon as this year, right? I mean, really, it already kind of is. Yeah. So it's all upside for me in that regard. But I do think, like like you said – the Joe Kim Noah type of player on this roster is the one that's missing. And that's why for me, I'm hopeful for this Clippers team that that workout or whatever that arrangement was that was canceled for mysterious reasons appears to be something that might be back on the table because I think it would be a match made in heaven for this roster. And, and we'll talk about Montrez here in a little bit, but it's very possible because Doc said yesterday, the only two locked into the starting lineup are obviously PG and Kawhi. It's very possible that Jamichael Green ends up as a starting center at some point. Montrez Harrell becomes a starting center at some point. You're going to see Trez a lot more, obviously, than Zoo. And I think that's one benefit to having Zoo is that you can play him at starting center, obviously, and with that contract. And he's okay only playing 15 to 20 minutes a night. And he's not going to complain and be a bad team chemistry guy. So that's what's important. Um, but speaking of team chemistry, Dwight Howard is back with the Los Angeles Lakers. Is he going to become the starting center for this team, or is it going to be a McGee? Well, if I'm looking down at my post-it that I wrote a little outline on before the show, I see D-W-I-G-H-T. So does that give you your answer, sir? Wow. You, you... I mean, and, and look, the the rationale for me is two two things. One is if Rajon Rondo is going to come off the bench and be the point guard off the bench, I think he makes more sense with JaVale McGee in the second unit so they can kind of run up and down and take advantage of the athleticism. And I think that's one reason why pe some people think JaVale is a much better defender than Zoo is because the athleticism is more noticeable when you're in the game watching it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's more effective, but it's more noticeable to see him jumping around and all that sort of stuff. But I think with Dwight, you have that big body that Anthony Davis has continually said is so important to have next to him. Dwight is built more like DeMarcus Cousins than JaVale McGee is, right? So in that capacity, a guy like Rudy Gobert, for example, you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with. Not that you're going to go up against that center every night, but even Dwight against Clint Capella, for example, could be something that's effective. So Dwight seems bought into this role, whatever it's going to be, because I think he really does realize this is his last chance in the NBA to make it work. He's on a totally non-guaranteed contract until January. I mean, it's a training camp deal. So as much as I want to say, God, I can't believe this is reality, under these circumstances, I don't understand how it could be a bad thing, especially when you've got the dominant personalities of LeBron and Anthony Davis leading the camp. How many minutes can he realistically play, though? I mean, that, that's a real question because this is a guy who continuously has gotten hurt throughout his career and right. cannot be someone relied on to so play more than 25 minutes. Yeah, no, I think it's a very fair question, especially if you want him to remain not only durable but effective as the season goes forward, right? Yeah. So I think if you have a situation where Dwight could play – let's say 20 minutes a game or even 18 minutes and you have JaVale playing 18 minutes and you have 12 minutes of Anthony Davis playing center or, you know, eight minutes of Anthony Davis playing center and four minutes of LeBron James playing center in a super small lineup, something like that. It's not impossible to do with this team, especially assuming Kyle Kuzma's health is sooner rather than later. So I think, you know, with JaVale, you're looking at maybe 15 to 18 minutes Dwight, maybe 15 to 22 minutes, depending upon his durability, health, effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera, especially his attitude, and then kind of piecing it together with Anthony Davis and or LeBron James and smaller lineups against other teams that go small. So I don't think the ask is going to be too large, and I think he should be able to do that. I mean, he looks to be in the best shape he's been in in some time. He says the back is feeling as good as it's as good as it can be, at least right now. And I don't think we're going to know until we know because he hasn't really gone through a season for two years now. Right. And what I'm curious to see is when do they go to Anthony Davis at center? And is that going to be an option? Because I'm assuming that it will be. We'll obviously talk about AD in a second. But with the Lakers, their best lineup may be with Anthony Davis at the five. Yeah. So that's I mean, one thing that'll be fun to fun to watch. For sure. and, and that's and that's the thing for me is that when Anthony Davis, you know, was when the trade was finally done. 
that was kind of the assumption that I was working under was that, okay, Anthony Davis is going to play, you know, a fair amount of five for this team, but he really views himself as a power forward. And, you know, if this is a guy you're going to build your franchise around and hand the keys to in the post LeBron era and all of that stuff, you should probably listen to what comes out of his mouth. Yeah. And to be fair, he can't bang down there with a Rudy Gobert. uh, I mean, for 25, 30 minutes, he just can't do that. So I don't think that's fair to him. And if you're going to have him around for a while, then obviously you want to listen to him and you want to play him at the four. So if we're going to protect that investment, you know, exactly, exactly. If we're going to compare the two centers, I would look at it as a wash. I think between zoo versus a Dwight McGee combo, I think it's pretty much a wash that neither center is going to be a key part to what both teams do. They're both going to provide, I think offense and defense. I think more so McGee will be relied on offensively then Zoo would be relied on. I don't think Dwight's going to be a big offensive force. I think they're both better rebounders, perhaps, um, on the Lakers' side. But with what the Clippers are doing, I think that Zoo fits in well. What do you think? No, I think that's said well. And I think, look, if the Lakers need to rely on either JaVale or Dwight for offense, something has gone wrong. Yeah, I would agree. And they're both good rebounders. They're known for the rebounding from the past. Dwight used to pull down 20 rebounds in his sleep. Um, Only a couple of years ago, he was doing that. So clearly he's a guy that can rebound the basketball. And if the two of them combine, if Dwight Howard and JaVale McGee can combine for 18 to 20 rebounds a game and a handful of block shots and score 10 to 15 points between them, I think the Lakers would take that every night. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Uh, And I think that's the key. I mean, if they can rebound the basketball and get the ball to the next guy that we're going to talk about, let's talk about LeBron. Um, Because LeBron James is the guy that made the decision to come to the Lakers. Um, And now you are hoping that he can continue at his, God, his legs have gone through hell and back with the amount of games he has played. You're hoping he can stay healthy. Last year, obviously, injury prone a bit. But let's compare him, I think, to Kawhi Leonard. I think that's the fair comparison at this moment is two guys that are going to play the three most likely. Kawhi and PG might switch, so it doesn't. who knows what we're going to do. But let's talk about the top player. Would you say LeBron James is the top player on this team, or would you say it's Anthony Davis? I would say Anthony Davis is the top player on this team in terms of raw, pure talent. Mm -hmm. But I would say LeBron James is the most effective player on this team, in part because prior to last year, for me, part of overall ability is availability and durability. Good point. It's it's a very good point. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So that's why we're going to do LeBron versus Kawhi. So two guys, very, very different in terms of where they are in their careers. Kawhi obviously has won several titles. Um, with different teams, and now he's going to try and win it with the Clippers. He decided to come to the Clippers via free agency. LeBron James decided to come to the Lakers via free agency. Um, Two very talented players. LeBron James, very much a facilitator. Kawhi Leonard can be a facilitator if needed, but more of a scorer perhaps. Um, Defensively, Kawhi is better than LeBron, I would say. Um, I would say so as well. uh, Where do you think the edge goes in this one? Because we're talking about LeBron now and not LeBron of five years ago. It's the truth. And, you know, I think a lot of Lakers fans want to take LeBron's side because it's sort of like that Kobe dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if he's in his fifth year or his 15th year. It's still Kobe. LeBron James even more so than that. Because of LeBron, his ability to impact the overall game and not in just one department necessarily. And look, I grew up on Kobe. That's not a knock on the guy. But Le- Kobe was more of a of a of a scorer, you know. I mean, that's that's what he did. He was clutch moments. He was taking over the game. LeBron can take over the game without scoring a point for five minutes, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I I think offensively, I would still rather have LeBron over Kawhi in a game of one on one. I would rather have LeBron over Kawhi, but in a in a team dynamic, I mean, I would still rather have LeBron over Kawhi, and and the reason why is even though he did struggle with injury last year, more so than we've seen, he also had the most time off he's had in however many years this summer, and Kawhi, the, the load management, it's supposed to be better this year, but watching him limp through the playoffs at certain points as effective as he was and obviously winning the title. I just can't get that thought out of the back of my mind yet. That's fair in terms of the injury. But like you just said, LeBron obviously was hurt for a while last year and he's only getting older. Um, I think with Kawhi, 
it's now to the point where it seems like he is 100%. But, I mean, let's look at the finals and just look up some of the numbers that he put up. 34 and 14 oh, in one game. It's it's ridiculous. 37 and 6 another. 36-12 another. 26-12 and 6. And the field goal percentage. I mean, 40% not good, obviously, in, the, in one game. But then you go for 53%, 50%. 44%. I mean, he's a guy that shoots the ball pretty well and shoots a lot of threes and can make them. So with Kawhi, I think at this point, I would actually prefer Kawhi Leonard. And frankly, we wouldn't be doing this podcast correctly if you weren't taking your guy and I wasn't taking my guy. I mean, we've pretty much right. agree, agreed so far. I think I would rather have Kawhi Leonard at this point. He's a guy that is 28 years old. He's still pretty young. Um, he'll be 29 in June. So he's going to have another year, obviously, until he turns 29. So he's going to go through his 28 season. He's six foot seven, 230 pounds. He's a guy that can, is a Swiss army knife. You can put him pretty much anywhere. LeBron James, frankly, can do the exact same thing. You can put him one through five and he'll be effective. And for Kawhi Leonard, you can pretty much put him one through four and, and he can be effective. So with these two players, they're the reasons why. Those two teams, the Clippers and the Lakers, are being called title favorites. And you and I are discussing both these players. We can go back and forth all day about how good both guys are. And I think really the key is for both Kawhi and for LeBron and then also for PG and for Anthony Davis, it's who stays healthy. Because all these guys have now been hurt throughout their career and missed many games. For Anthony Davis, it's never really been a huge injury that – has carried over. It's if Dan Bespris, obviously the man of hoop ball is convinced that he has something going wrong with his bowel system. And that's the reason why he continues to go back to the locker room at some point during every single game. But that, it, that is really part of the reason why, I mean, this year could be a different year if I collect the number one overall pick in any fantasy league. Mm -hmm. But prior to this year, that is exactly why I could not rationalize taking Anthony Davis first overall. I know how effective he can be, and I know he could be the best overall fantasy player. But every night going back to the locker room for something, I really hope that's something that curtails during his tenure in Los Angeles. So you're taking LeBron, obviously, in this one. Uh, I, I, I am. And let me ask you this. This is because I think you make fair points as well. And look, it's a matter of your perception when you come down on any side of a conversation yeah. and you try to understand where the other side is coming from. So let me ask you this question. When, in your estimation, if ever, has Kawhi Leonard played with a player like Paul George at this point in Paul George's career? I mean, you could say Duncan. Right. So that's kind of where my mind was going as well. And I wonder longer term what that dynamic will look like in terms of its impact for both players. Right. I mean, look, Paul George and Russell Westbrook were paired together last year. and We kind of saw how that played out at times. And it's not that I think Paul George or Kawhi Leonard won't buy into that dynamic. I'm just curious to see how that plays out, because it's something that neither one of them has really experienced, at least recently. Yeah, and for Kawhi, it seems like he really wanted to play with PG. Some of these guys yeah. are put into situations with guys they don't want to play with. Um, and I think these two guys really mesh well together. And I think because of just their basketball IQ, I think that they'll be fine. Uh, and I think that they fit I mean, so th well together defensively and offensively. I, yeah, and I think so too. I'm just curious to see what it looks like because yeah. I haven't yet. Mm -hmm. And I think defensively, just – the idea of Patrick Beverly, Kawhi Leonard, and Paul George on the perimeter is amazing right now. Yeah, it's frightening. It, it should be frightening for any single team. I mean, when you, when you have Paul George at six foot nine, you have Kawhi Leonard at six foot seven, and then you have a guy like Patrick Beverly that's a six foot one pest. I mean, those three guys are going to form the best defense in the NBA. I, I mean, they fr I, they frankly will. I mean, you and then you add a guy like Andrew Landry Shamit that we talked about what he did against Curry, and then perhaps someone like. All it really takes is one big that is going to buy in. I mean, if you obviously Trez is not known for his defense, but he's a guy that you can throw in there. You can throw in Jamichael Green. You can even throw in a guy like Harkless that is more known for his defense, and they can have a nasty defensive team. I believe Stan Van Gundy once said it best when he said, build an F and wall. Yes. That's sort of what they're going to be capable of doing. And that's the one advantage the Lakers have is that the perimeter, obviously, like you just said, is where these guys are going to be real annoying. 
But with Anthony Davis, he's a guy that you can throw the ball to down low and let him go to work. And yesterday you saw several different plays where he's a guy that can just get it done. And he can get slapped on and he can get destroyed, fade away and hit a jumper from 15 with ease. And he does it in his sleep. So that's one advantage that Anthony Davis has. And it'll be fascinating to see how the Clippers defend Anthony Davis. Because what's the best part about this two-team dynamic is that the, when you look at offense versus defense, it's who's going to defend AD, and then it's who's going to defend Kawhi and PG. Because you don't have two lockdown guys that can defend Kawhi and PG. And the Clippers don't have that lockdown guy to defend Anthony Davis. They don't. And, and I think that's the biggest, you know, I think D'Angelo Russell said it after last night's preseason game against the Lakers. He said, you know, it's just they're, they're big out there and you don't know how to defend them at times. And with a lot of teams going small, the Lakers decision to go big could be a dif- differentiating factor, especially against all these teams that are so tightly packed together. I mean, the difference between 55 wins and 50 wins could be the difference between one and eight in the Western Conference. Yeah, it's, it's true. So uh, they're obviously neck and neck, Kawhi and and LeBron, I think I'll give the edge to Kawhi. They're, they're, I, would you say that they're both top five players? Yes. So when you when you have a top five player, I have this conversation with my friends a lot. It's almost a matter of preference at that point. Yes, I, I would agree. And then you look at Paul George and Anthony Davis. Um, and I think obviously Anthony Davis, number one pick, like you said, in fantasy. Paul George is coming off two shoulder surgeries, which is a bit of a concern, but two, two different shoulder surgeries as yes, well, but he is practicing. He's in Hawaii. He's getting shots up. He's getting advice from Jerry West. Um, it seems like they are very much babying him and not letting him come back until he's fully healthy. He said he's 85 to 90%, which probably means he's closer to about 75 to 80% would be my guess. He's going to sit out for the first six games Um, I don't think that's a huge concern. I don't think he's going to sit out for very much more than that. There are some people that think, well, that can get extend to maybe 15 to 20. You never know if he's going to have a setback. I think they're taking him slow enough that I don't think that's going to be a problem. Then, obviously, you have Anthony Davis, the prize acquisition for the Lakers during the offseason, and a guy that, like we have talked about, no real huge injury that's been a problem, but a guy that can't stay on the floor, it seems like, for a 48-minute game. When you look at these two players, uh, I'll be honest, I think that Anthony Davis is the better player offensively. Defensively, obviously, Anthony Davis gets steals and blocks as well. I think Paul George on the perimeter is better. Anthony Davis down low is better defensively. So I would give the nod to Anthony Davis by a slight margin. Yeah, and I think that's fair. But like you said, Paul George has been, unless he sustained a major injury, he's been available. Anthony Davis, you can't always say that's the case. So it's not that we're worried about Anthony Davis, you know, aggravating a, a chronic hamstring injury or a long or a previous ACL injury or anything like that. But I'm just very curious to see at what level the wear and tear is there for him, because if it is similar to his Pelicans tenure, especially in those seasons when it was every other night or just about so it seemed, the Lakers are going to get tested and get tested early. Yeah, it will be fascinating to see how much of the load Anthony Davis can carry without getting overwhelmed and without getting hurt. Because well, I th- and, I, and I think, too, that not only the trade-off between LeBron and AD in games in within the same game, but I think there will be times where, you know, a – AD, I got it tonight type of thing from LeBron where Anthony Davis can focus more on rebounding the basketball or playing down low versus nights where LeBron looks at AD or AD looks at LeBron and says, hey, it's it's my night tonight. So I think there's going to be a little bit of give and take there as they continue to figure out how to play with each other as well. And hopefully that allows each one of them to sort of lighten the load as well. Because look, the reality is LeBron can't play 35 minutes a game. I mean, I would love for him to, but I, I, I worry about that if that's going to be the average amount of minutes for him. Do you buy this whole passing the torch thing that LeBron is uh, pretty much showing up in the media and continuously saying, hey, this is I'm going to give AD the ball. I mean, AD yeah. is so good offensively. AD can it's, be an MVP candidate. It's so interesting because, look, he's ve- it's, it's a very purposeful move. I, I've been observant of this as well, and I think it's it says volumes when LeBron is sort of seating the throne is how I've phrased it previously. And, you know, I think it's inviting to Anthony Davis on a number of levels, and LeBron doesn't do anything by accident, right? He's trying to sell Anthony Davis on the future of the Lakers because he knows it benefits him right now as well. So I buy it to that extent. 
it's easier to say before the action starts. It's harder to do when you see your team struggling or if things aren't going as you expected or in those moments of true challenge. It's, it's harder to stick to that path. But I think LeBron does have an interest in, you know, not averaging 25 points a game, maybe averaging 20 points a game, but averaging 12 assists a game. I think that does appeal to him. He is that type of player. Yeah, he, he can be. The question is, will he be? Because – Kobe, right, Kobe as, Bryant, as I tell my students all the time, you are capable, but are you willing? Exactly, and for Kobe Bryant, towards the end of his career, we noticed, hey, the Lakers are actually doing better when he's getting a triple-double every night, and he's getting 15 points with 10 rebounds and 12 assists. But is he okay doing that for a while? That's the question with LeBron James. Are you okay getting the 10 to 12 assists per game and Anthony Davis outscoring you and becoming the guy offensively? Are you okay with that? Because the first slump that the Lakers get into, and there will be a slump because it happens to every single team, who's going to be the guy that gets them out of it? Is LeBron going to be the guy that says, hey, I got this, and he's going to try and take over, and Anthony Davis maybe gets a little pissed off that that's happening? Or is it going to be the combination of the two working together? That will be the thing I think that you have to watch. Yeah, and I think, let me say it like this. I think the Lakers will be a better team if Anthony Davis averages more points than LeBron James this season. Yes, absolutely. 100%, I think that's a fact. I mean, there's no question about it. So, if we compare the two, let's say PG is healthy. Let's look towards the end of the year. PG versus Anthony Davis. I think, obviously, you're going to give Anthony Davis a slight nod uh, sure. in his favor, but I think it's pretty close. Would you agree? Yeah, I do. And, and you know, they they obviously also bring different things to the table, so it's always hard to compare through that lens as well. And I think that, you know, the reality is both players are going to be of massive import to their teams, but if Paul George were to struggle, I, I think the Clippers could get by more uh, more effectively than if Anthony Davis were to struggle and it would be put on LeBron. And it's going to be because of the bench. As we head there, let's first recap the starting lineup. Point guard, we think that Patrick Beverly has the advantage over a guy like Avery Bradley. Shooting guard, Landry Shamit, I think is very close to Danny Green, but Danny Green perhaps get the slight nod offensively. Defensively, it's going to be close this year. That'll be fun to watch. Kawhi and PG, we think obviously are neck and neck with AD. And with LeBron James and the center, we think is pretty much a wash. So all in all, the starting lineups are very similar. I think in- very, they're very, they're they're very close to one another, and that's and that's part of what makes these two teams sort of sit fun to sit here and debate. And I think has been subject to so much of the conversation since all of this unfolded. Okay, so let's head to the bench and uh, let's name a couple of guys here: Lou Williams, Montrez Harrell, Mo Harkless, Rodney Magruder, Jermichael Green, Jerome Robinson, and Terrence Mann. And let's not forget about Patrick Patterson. That's the Clippers' arsenal coming off the bench for the Lakers. Not quite the same, Ethan. Uh, how do you look at the Lakers' bench and who's going to be the key guys off the bench? Of course, Kyle Kuzma, but who else? Well, you know, assuming Kuzma assumes that six-man role, I actually think that Jared Dudley is going to play a role for this team. And I don't know what how you feel about that, but I can tell you that I think that they need a guy who's willing to stand out there and communicate within the second unit. Dwight Howard and JaVale McGee is a nice one-two at the center combination. We sort of talked about that when we were going through the starting lineup. KCP off the bench I feel like can be more effective. I like Alex Caruso and what he brings to the table. Quinn Cook is a guy who could light it up with instant offense if you need that. Same goes of Troy Daniel. If you're looking for those kind of players, I think those two right now are probably on the outside looking in when it comes to the rotation. Taylor Horton Tucker is a giant question mark. Love the idea of him, but we're not going to rely on a second round pick who didn't even play in summer league for a title contending team. Uh, David Stockton was just brought into the mix. He's a training camp body. Uh, Costas Atenacumpo, Zach Norvell on two way deals. But the Lakers are probably going to go about 10, 9 or 10 deep under Frank Vogel. The bench is going to have to get consistent production from Kyle Kuzma, of course. But also they're going to have to get consistent production from the backup point guard position, whether that's Alex Caruso, whether that's Quinn Cook, whether that's Rajon Rondo. All four of those guys, including Avery Bradley, 
can't play. So at least one of those is going to go by the wayside in terms of the rotation. And with Danny Green and KCP, I'm very curious to see how the minutes are, are shared. And depending upon what type of lineups they want to roll out again, Danny Green's a guy who could play quote, small forward, quote unquote, in certain constructs, like if LeBron is the point guard. So it's going to be fascinating to see what kind of combinations they, they put together. But I think Jared Dudley, especially to begin this season, because Kyle Kuzma's availability is in question, will play an important role. And I can't love it, but I don't hate it. I think the biggest difference between these two teams, obviously, is the bench. But to go That's even great. deeper on that, I think the biggest difference is that if anybody from the Clippers bench was asked to go into the starting lineup, I don't think they would miss a beat. For the Lakers, if anybody from their bench outside of Kyle Kuzma was asked to go in the starting lineup, I think they'd be in big trouble. And I think that's the biggest issue with, with the Lakers versus the Clippers. I, I would I would say I would say that's definitely true if you're talking about LeBron James or the Anthony Davis spots. I think point guard, depending upon how things look and continue to look in the preseason and, and in training camp that could or could not be the case. I mean, I'm banking on the idea of Avery Bradley's potential and all the hype and how he's looked, et cetera, et cetera. Uh-oh. Center, center <laughs> with Dwight and JaVale, those guys are kind of interchangeable right now. But but I get what the point of what you're saying. And honestly, the fact that the Clippers, you know, they have two last year, two of the leading six man of the year candidates on the same team, both contributing at a high level. And the idea that Montrez Harrell and Lou Williams, if you put either of those guys on the Lakers bench outside of Kyle Kuzma, either one of those guys would definitely be the next best player. What's interesting is I actually think that Lou and Trez are better than Kuzma. I think there's a lot of hype around Kuzma. I think that if he was on a different team, I don't think he'd be getting the hype that he's getting. I don't think he'd be in the shoe deal that he's currently getting. He's a nice player. Oh, that's, a, that's a guarantee. I mean, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Kuzma's a nice player. But oh, I would have rather I would have rather had traded Kuzma and kept Ingram. I've been very vocal about that. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense because I don't think that Kuzma does anything besides score the basketball. I don't think there's a lot else that he provides to your team, whereas Brandon yeah. Ingram can do it all if he taps into his potential. And Ingram is younger, and there's a lot of other reasons to not go down that rabbit hole, but that's neither here nor there. But that is the fact with Kuzma of what he's going to have to show this season. Kind of like I was saying earlier, the Lakers are going to ask him to do all of these things that he has not shown he can do yet. So in that transition, if he's able to assume the six-man role and score in that capacity, hopefully clinging on to that idea of familiarity will allow him to have an easier time with the transition. But if Kuzma falls short of making that transition, it's going to be a harder-than-expected journey for the Lakers this year. And one thing with the Clippers is Lou, Trez, Jermichael Green, all enormous pieces to what they did last year. Jermichael Green was huge in the playoffs, he, if you watched That was that. a great re-signing. I was hoping the Lakers were going to bring him in. Yeah, he, he's huge. So that's eight guys right there. Then you trade for Harkless, and you get Magruder as well. Then you're really talking about a team that is 10 deep. Then Jerome Robinson now is starting, obviously, in place of Kawhi Leonard since he's on the bench. And then Terrence Mann was really impressive in the first preseason game to the point where all the players on the Clippers said they want to see him play more. And so we're going to see more of him tonight. And I'll be curious to see how he performs, which is interesting for a guy that's a rookie that's being asked to play more from the veteran guy. So... You look at the bench, Lou, Trez, Harkless, Magruder, Jermichael Green, those five versus what the Lakers are going to throw out, and I think that's where you're going to see the Clippers have a massive advantage. We talked about the starting lineup, very similar. I think the Clippers have a much better bench, and because of that, I think we'll see them probably have a better regular season because if a guy like Kawhi needs to sit out a night or a guy like PG is going to sit out versus if Anthony Davis or LeBron are going to sit out, because let's be honest, they cannot play 82 games. If they play 82 games, they're going to rot and they're going to be in trouble for the playoffs. I think that's where the Clippers have the advantage. Absolutely. The Clippers are a deeper team. There's no question about it. So as a, my best friend is a Clippers fan, and he's been a Clippers fan since, you know, we're talking Darius Miles era and before. And I said to him recently, I said, look, I think the Clippers are probably going at a regular season record than the Lakers. I said, but in a seven game series, I can't say that that better regular season record is going to be a clear indicator that they will come out on top. 
Yeah, that's what's going to be fascinating is what the rotations look like come playoff time because regular season-wise, and now why don't we just jump to the predictions? That's how we'll kind of close out this pod is we'll talk about, by the way, head coaches, I don't think there's much discussion. I think that Doc Rivers is, has the edge over Frank Vogel. Would you agree there? Doc, Doc Rivers is a Hall of Fame coach. I think people are weirdly down on him as a coach still for some reason, but he is a Hall of Fame coach, and Frank Vogel is not yet, at least. So, yes, I don't think that's even a conversation. Okay, not worth talking about. So, predictions-wise, curious to get your take on where you think the Clippers will finish and where you think the Lakers will finish, and I'll do the same. Um, I'm going to make you start because I, I think it'll be interesting to see what you think. Where do you think the Clippers finish in the regular season? Where do you think the Lakers finish? And who do you think wins the NBA title? Okay, wow. So are we going with full NBA uh, regular season record predictions here? Uh, we don't need to go record. Uh, I think – I mean, you can go win total if you want. Um, okay. But uh, where do you th- – yeah, I mean, go ahead. Whatever you want to do. You want to go with the number uh, of wins? You want to go with where they finish regular season? I don't care. I would set the over-under for a number of wins for the Clippers at 54. Would you take the over or the under? Funny, I was going to say that exact same number. Um, I think I would take the over because you're looking at a team that had 48 wins last year. And by the way, everyone keeps saying, and I'm going to say this as a Clippers fan, everyone's like, oh, 48 wins, and then you add, obviously, Kawhi and PG. You also lost Gallinari and SGA. So those two guys are gone so if a guy and, like Kawhi, and the rest of the Western Conference got better, right? And you have Kawhi and PG that perhaps are going to sit out a game. So if those two guys aren't on the floor at the same time, then you lose two guys in Gallo and SGA, and you only gain maybe one for one for a couple of games. And obviously, I would take Kawhi over those two, no doubt about it. Um, I think I'll still take the over. I think this team is not going to be load managed as much as people think. I think Kawhi is going to play more than people think, and I don't think PG is going to miss as many games. As people think, so I will take the over in that case. Where would you go? I would t- I would take the over, but but not by much. I mean, I'm thinking like 55, maybe 56 wins. Mm-hmm. Basically, that thinking the Clippers win two thirds of their games or th- just about, and that sounds about right to me. So 54, I mean, really 54 and a half if we're Vegas over here. That's probably probably what I would set it on. Um, and I think people would be, you know, hedging their bet a little bit, but I think the Lakers are in a, in a similar spot as well. I would set, you know, for the Lakers over under, I would set 52 and that's really high given where they finished last season. I was going to say the exact same number too. Um, I would say the Clippers finish at 56 or 57. And I think they end up as the two or three seed. Um, and I think the Lakers finish with about 52 and I think they end up as, Probably the five seed. What do you think? And I think that's fair. I think the Lakers are obviously going to want to finish like any other team in that top four spot to get the home court advantage. But I think the four or five seed is is probably a realistic ask of this group. I mean, look, if they come out and start 16 and four in the first 20 games, the conversation totally swings differently. But if they're 12 and eight through 20 games, then, you know, the rest of the Western Conference is going to be right around there, if not better as well. I think what people are really, as much as we're talking about parity and all of that, you think about a team like Portland that people just seem to always forget about that has been together the majority of that group now for a while. Granted, Hassan Whiteside is coming in, so that's a different conversation. But Obviously, McCollum and uh, Dame have been together for a while. Then you've got teams that aren't necessarily in the playoff conversation, but they're around the picture in the Porzingis and Luka Doncic Dallas Mavericks, in Darren Fox's Sacramento Kings. There are no nights off anymore in this conference. So even the most talented teams are going to have those quote-unquote schedule losses. Yeah, I mean, we. I was going to bring it up, and we might as well talk about it if – we think that the Clippers end up as probably the two or the three, and the Lakers end up as probably the four or the five. Um, I'm curious as to who you think will end up at the one spot because there's a lot of talk. And frankly, who do you think – actually, a better way to phrase it is, who do you think is the biggest competition to the Lakers outside of the Clippers? Probably Houston. Interesting. Okay. I would say the Denver Nuggets. So that's and, funny... and that's another team that pe- nobody wants to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm just scri- I'm scri- I'm literally sitting here scribbling on my notepad. Houston, Utah, Portland, both LA teams, mm-hmm. Denver, maybe Golden State. Yeah, they're gonna get Clay Thompson back, right? That's already seven teams right there. Mm-hmm. 
It's a very good conference and one that is going to be an absolute battleground. If you look at last year, you had Houston finish one. I think they're going to be in the playoffs again. I mean, okay. sorry, right now, look at the preseason things. That was stupid. Um, let's look at the regular season. There you go. Okay, so Golden State won. That's the question. I think they're still going to be in the playoff picture. I think they're good enough. They're well coached enough. Denver, right. two. They'll stay in the conversation. Portland, I don't think that they'll miss the playoffs. They're a very good team. They'll be probably close to the seven or eight seed, I would imagine, though. Houston, they're staying. Utah is staying. OKC is dropping out. San Antonio, probably going to drop out. Um, the Clippers are obviously going to be there. The Lakers will jump back in. And then you have Sacramento, a team that just missed the playoffs last year. You have a team. And, and got better. Correct. You have the New Orleans Pelicans, who have a pretty good starting lineup that people don't realize. I mean, that's, you, that's, the, that's the biggest question mark, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you bring in Derek Favors. You bring in J.J. Redick. You have Zion. You have a very good team. And obviously all the they, Lakers pieces as well. You could tell me that that team could win 35 games and I'd believe you. You could tell me that team could win 50 games and I'd believe you. Yeah. So it's going to be an absolute battle in the Western Conference. Do you think the Lakers win it all? It's going to be really hard to do that in their first year. Everything has to align perfectly in order for that to happen. They cannot have any sort of setback, major injury, anything veer off track in any capacity. Whereas a team, I feel like, um, let's say Milwaukee in the Eastern Conference, for example, even, or especially the Clippers that have been together, at least the supporting parts for a little bit longer, the Clippers could lose a guy like Montrez Harrell for a little bit of time and still not veer off track. If the Lakers miss Kyle Kuzma for an extended period of time, they're already operating from a deficit. I think if everyone stays healthy, I think the Clippers will end up winning the title. That being said, I think that you have to at least go to the Western Conference Finals this year and I think that whoever has the most healthy team out of the Lakers, the Clippers, Milwaukee, and Philadelphia will end up being the team that wins the title eventually. I think I think that's fair because those are the teams that have probably the most star power outside of Houston, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Because of Harden and Westbrook, obviously. Yeah. But I think those, those teams have the most star power in terms of individual two-man or three-man combinations. But in looking at this and everything we just talked about, Houston, Utah, Portland, both LA teams, Denver, Golden State, San Antonio, Sacramento, New Orleans. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten teams. So two of those teams are not making it. And I think Sacramento is in, San Antonio is out, and then it's between the Warriors or the Pelicans. Because Denver, the Clippers, the Lakers, the Blazers, the Jazz, and the Rockets are all going to the playoffs. Yeah, by the way, we always think that we know what's going to happen, and we end up not knowing and what's going to happen. And the Phoenix Suns have won 48 games. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not going to happen. That, I can that we know for damn that. sure that they are not going to make the playoffs. Yeah, but that's not going to happen. Nobody thought the Clippers would win 48 games last year and end up going to the playoffs and get that experience for their youngsters. So before we say goodbye, Ethan, where can everyone follow you, and where can they follow the Hoop All Lakers podcast? Uh, you can follow the Hoop Ball Lakers account at Hoop Ball Lakers in the Apple Podcast app. You can find us at the Hoop Ball Lakers on Twitter. You can find me at Ethan underscore Nora. Make sure you hit us up and listen to the Hoop Ball Lakers podcast on the regular Basketball's Back, baby. And we here. And what was the most recent podcast for the Hoop Ball Lakers pod? The most recent podcast talked about early training camp storylines with my man, J.C. DeLeon. Talked about Avery Bradley's emergence, Dwight Howard's addition, and what Kyle Kuzma's foot injury might impact the bench. There you go. And you can follow the Hoopball Clippers podcast at Hoopball Clips. You can follow me at BD Marcus. You can follow Hoopball at Hoopball Fantasy. Do not forget, this is a Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee presentation. Hawaiian Isles has that coffee. Are you on the coffee kick? Are you on that H.I. Kona coffee kick? You already know I got to be. Come on, man. I teach high school. There you go. So coffee's a good thing. Keeps you up and it gives you the energy that you need. Please go ahead. Give both of these podcasts a five-star review. Give us those five stars. Friend it. Share it. Whatever you need to do. And don't forget, follow us on Twitter as well. And before we say goodbye, final prediction for the NBA Finals. Who are the two teams? And who's going to win? Ethan, I'm putting you on the spot. 
Oh, man. All right. Well, I got to be that guy. I'm going to take the Lakers. I'm going to line them up against the Sixers and going to crush Allen Iverson's soul one more time. Lakers are going to take them all. And I'll take the Clippers over the Milwaukee Bucks. And that is how we wrap up this crossover podcast. Hoopball Clippers, Hoopball Lakers. I'm Brandon Marcus. He is Ethan Noroff. Make sure you go and listen to both of the podcasts. Support them. We really appreciate it. And until next time, have a good one, everybody. We out. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.